Okay, guys, we're going to start Chapter 8 of Lily's Crossing. Um, when we left off, uh, Lily had been up in the attic of Margaret's house, and she had seen um, she had seen Albert down on the beach, and then she decided she was going to follow him because she thought that he was a spy. Graham was sitting on the couch in the living room when Lily came in. She was listening to Portia Face's life. Lily liked to listen to Portia, too. In fact, she and Margaret had sent away for Portia's picture. They'd written a letter straight to WEAF radio station just before Margaret had left. Margaret said stars like Portia always had pictures of themselves lying around. Right now on the radio, Portia's husband, Walter, was a prisoner of war in Germany, and he had just thought of an escape plan. He was going to hide in a small boat. Then when an American ship passed, he'd signal it with a flashlight and row out to freedom. Lily sank down on one end of the couch as far away from Graham as she could get to listen. She could see Graham's hand, soft and plump on the pillows. Graham's wedding ring was a sliver of silver that had made a deep ridge in her finger. I was skinny until you started school, she had told Lily once, laughing. Then I started to eat and found out how good food was. Lily couldn't picture it, couldn't picture Graham skinny and swimming all the way across Jamaica Bay. Her father had told her Graham had done that. I watched her when I was small, he had said. She had a braid to her waist, and she was like a seal in the water. Graham still had the braid, but now it was twisted around in back of her head in a bun. At night, she'd take out the bobby pins, run her fingers through her hair, and brush it. Graham's hand was moving. Lily watched out of the corner of her eye as the plump fingers walked across the pillows, and Graham's arm came up around her. Lily was about to shrug her arm away, about to get up, but it felt so good to be sitting there in that circle that she moved closer. A moment later, she was crying, and she didn't even try to stop. I know, Graham said. Lily shook her head. No, you don't. Graham touched her sleeve, making tiny pleats in the cotton with her fingers. We were going to go fishing, Lily said, and to the movies. We were going to do everything. Your father said exactly the same thing, Graham said. Lily looked up. Really? Graham nodded. Your eyes will be red. She, said, she shook her head. I don't care. Yes, you will, Graham said. We're going out to dinner. Trixie's restaurant? Of course not. There's a war on and not a penny to spare for such foolish... Graham broke off. We're going to Orban's. Lily sat up straight. She could feel her mouth suddenly go dry. I'm not... Mr. Orban said you did a magnificent job on his headlight. I don't... There's a surprise for you, Mrs. Orban said. Lily bit her lip. Some surprise, as if she couldn't guess. Albert... Lily moved back to her end of the couch. She was definitely not going to the Orban's house, not in a million skillion years. I'm not, Lily began again and stopped. She always loved to go to the Orban's for dinner. Sometimes there was a flounder Mr. Orban had caught that morning with corn on the cob and a cake with jelly icing on top. How could she say she didn't want to go that she knew about Albert? And worse, that he knew about her. Graham wouldn't take no for an answer. Never. Graham was up from the couch now. We'll have to see what happens to Walter on the radio tomorrow, she said. They're certainly stretching this out. Lily followed her into the bathroom and watched as Graham opened her compact and took out her powder puff. Lily leaned forward to look in the mirror. Her eyes were red, and so was her nose. Here, Graham ran a washcloth under the tap. Nice and cool. She held it up to Lily's eyes. It'll be better in a minute. Just wait and see. Graham was right. Lily held her head back and felt the coolness of the cloth on her eyes and cheeks. In back of her, she could hear the news. An American general had told reporters he needed only three hours of good weather and the army could break out of Normandy and start across France. Strange, Lily thought. In France, the weather was gray and cloudy and the Americans were caught on a beach that was wet and cold. Here in Rockaway, it was beautiful. She checked the mirror again. No one would guess she'd been crying. Graham took her powder puff and waved it over Lily's nose. I think I hear the church bells. We're supposed to be there at six. Come on. Lily walked out behind her, taking the smallest steps she possibly could. She dreaded having to meet Albert, actually meet him at last. She wouldn't say a word to him. She'd talk to Mr. and Mrs. Orban and not even look at him. Mrs. Orban was waiting at the door, excited and smiling. Have I got a surprise for you, she said. And behind her was Albert. Albert, with that mop of dark hair and blue eyes. She took a quick look at him, after all. He was looking at her, too. His mouth opened. You are Lily? Of course she is Lily, Mrs. Orban said. Lily raised one eyebrow and put on her 
Too bad for you, Sister Eileen Face. Usually she was good at that, but halfway into the face, her eyes slid away because for the quickest second, it looked as if Albert was going to laugh. When she looked back, he was tapping his lip, looking at her, his own eyebrows raised. What was that all about, she wondered. Albert was crazy. But then Mrs. Mr. Orban was leading them to the table, his hand on Lily's back, smiling. Sit here next to me, he told Graham, and Lily, my love, across from Albert, my nephew. Albert's here for my brother Emery's in Canada to spend the summer. From Hungary, Mrs. Orban said at the same time, to be safe from the war. Albert looked up. He spoke to Graham, though, not even glancing at Lily. I'm from Budapest, two years ago. The word sounded strange on his tongue, almost musical. Mrs. Orban shook her head. It was a long trip for Albert, through Austria and Switzerland, across the mountains to France, then a ship. She stopped for a breath. With Ruth, Albert said. Mrs. Orban's face suddenly looked different, older, sad. His eight-year-old sister was sick, she told them. She's caught in France. Albert made a sound, said something. Lily took a quick look, but he was smearing margarine over a slice of bread, looking down. And then Mr. Orban began to talk quickly, and so did Graham. And Lily bent over her plate to bone the fish and begin on the corn. She was starving. Albert must have been starving, too. He bent over his own plate, his hand made a fist around his fork. He ate fast, taking huge bites, shoveling it in. Graham would have had a fit if she had done that. He raised his head, and immediately she looked past him toward the lemon cake on the counter and beyond the window. Outside, pairs of socks were hanging on the porch railing. The water was flat and slick with the sun slanting over it. Isn't this perfect, Mrs. Orban said. Just as Margaret leaves, Albert comes. You'll have someone to fish with all summer, Lily. <clears throat> Graham was staring at her. Lily could feel her eyes. Graham thought she knew what Lily was thinking, although though Lily, sorry, thought Lily wouldn't go to the beach with any boy, fish with him, go to the Cross Bay Theater. What Graham didn't know was that it was probably the other way around. Yes, said Graham. It's perfect, isn't it, Lily? She didn't look at Graham. She took a chunk of corn off the cob with a bite almost as big as Albert's. She certainly couldn't answer them with her mouth full. Albert had finished his fish and corn and was into the peas now. Mounds of peas were falling off the edge of the fork, and suddenly he looked up and saw her watching him. He was laughing, bringing his hand up to his mouth, and just as suddenly she knew what he was doing. He was reminding her of the lipstick, Gert's department store. Good grief. It was a good thing Mrs. Orban was talking, otherwise Lily might have jumped up to race out of there and never come back. But what was Mrs. Orban saying? Albert doesn't know the ocean. He doesn't know how to swim. And Lily, Mr. Orban said, swims like a mermaid. She'll teach you, Albert, Mrs. Orban said. No one swims the way Lily does. Teach him to swim? She couldn't believe it. Except for her grandmother, said Mr. Orban. Graham laughed. I haven't put my foot in the water since I taught Lily to swim. Lily remembered that, remembered paddling around in the water, listening as Graham held her feet lightly, pointing her big toes toward each other, angling her hands so the sides of her index fingers slid into the water first. Everything makes a difference, Graham had said. And one Friday night, they had showed her father. No life vest anymore, and by that time, Lily could dive. She went off the side of the porch, her toes digging into the railing for an instant, and then pushing up, arms stretched, head down. She slid underneath smoothly with the sound of the water in her ears, the taste of it on her tongue, up then, and swimming in front of the houses easily, almost as easily as she could walk. Moments later, she had climbed back up. Her father had wrapped her in a huge towel, hugging her and telling her how proud her mother would have been. And now Graham was telling the Orbans about Poppy. I hope he's still at the fort, she said. In back of them, the tea kettle was whistling. Graham's face was sad. He'll go to Europe soon, any day. Maybe he's gone already. I hope it isn't Germany. Lily stuffed her mouth with bread. She wanted to stuff her ears, too. She didn't want Graham to talk about it. She didn't want to think about it. Then Mrs. Orban passed some slices of lemon cake, apologizing because it was made with margarine and not butter, and Albert began to eat again, two pieces, and then a third. He didn't look at Lily again, and she sat there thinking about him laughing at her and wondering about his sister Ruth and trying to pretend she didn't notice he was there until they finished and it was time to go home.